We're here to answer your game, gaming, and game night questions, working with you to make your game nights better. Tonight's question comes from patron of the show, Dr. Donna Bowman, our very own Patch the Paladin. And Donna writes, Your scythe review was terrific. It got me thinking about possible Ask the Bellhop question. What are the pros and cons of various end-of-game rules? Things like, everybody gets another turn, the round completes back to start player, or the game ends immediately. Are there any interesting, creative, or unusual end-of-game rules you've run across? Well, thank you so much for the question, Donna, and of course for being a patron of our show. You too could become one of our awesome Patreon patrons by heading to patreon.com slash tabletopbellhop and tipping your bellhop. So it's been a while since we've done a non-game recommendation topic, and I wanted to get back to doing those a little more often. And when looking for such a topic, I ran into this question from Donna and thought it sounded like a fun topic. Now, what's not obvious from Donna's question is exactly what prompted this in the first place. Like They do mention the Scythe review, and that is the fact that Scythe has a very unique endgame mechanism that is one of the big points of contention um, with fans and detractors of the game. Both sides have opinions on this one. Now, this mechanism is actually one of the things that turned me off the game my first experience with it, which anyone who watched our review knows that I did not enjoy the game at all until giving it a second chance. So inside, you earn stars for competing, a, completing a wide variety of objectives, building your mecha, building, winning battles, getting to the end of the popularity track, etc. The game ends immediately when any player earns their sixth star. This can happen even in the middle of a player's turn. You mm -hmm. don't even finish the full turn. You just complete the action that earned the star, and it's done. That combined with the fact it's not unusual for a player to earn more than one star in a turn. And I know I have personally managed to earn three in one turn, which can lead to the game ending very abruptly and way earlier than players plan on. I've even accidentally ended a game by doing one action that would have led to a ton of points on my second action. And when doing that first action, I ended up getting a star and the game ended and I never got to take the second action. And I know other people have messed up that rule many times and it's forgot about it and counted on it to, you know, get them a big points in the last move of the game. In short, the way a game ends can have a powerful influence over the way the game is played with mm -hmm. players adapting strategy to maximize their score and or minimize opponents when it gets down to the approaching end. Scythe isn't the only game I played where I was frustrated by the end game condition, though. Donna mentions three of the main ways games end. The end trigger is met, and then one of these three things happens. The game ends at the end of the turn. You finish that player's turn. At the end of that player's turn, that's it. No one gets to go again. You total up the points or do whatever you do at the end of the game. Someone wins the race. You finish out the round with every player getting an equal number of turns, or the game goes one additional round after that. Now, I would add another common one to that, and that's the everyone else gets one more turn and it doesn't matter the round order. You're not going to first player, it's just everyone else gets one turn. Now, while these all sound deceptively similar, in a highly competitive games, one turn can be the difference between first and last place, completing yep. your master stroke or flopping. Now, I know a lot of people that hate the fact that some games allow different players to get an uneven amount of turns. A lot of these players are players who take the competition of a game very seriously and are all about winning and feel that if everyone did not get the same chance, take the same number of actions, it's not fair to the players who got less. For whatever reason, maybe because I don't take games all that seriously, like, yes, I've said it before, I play to win, but I don't really care if I win or lose. That never bothered me. But I know it's something that bugs Deanna in games where it applies. Now, one hopes that the designers have playtested and chosen their particular endgame mechanism with careful thought. And similarly, as a player, you should carefully pay attention to the mechanism and timing. But sometimes you just get caught. Yeah. So looking at these four main types, I think my favorite of these is everyone gets one more turn. What I like most is this will often cause players to be worried about ending the game. And it kind of extends the game. And I like engine builder games, right? That's the type of game I like. And I always love to be able to run my engine that one more time. And I'm always worried about trying to end things too early. And you don't want to give that advantage of one more turn to everyone else. So you worry about ending it. 
This works best to me in high scoring engine building games where you're earning a lot of points in that final turn where, you know, every game turn you're running two, you're earning four, you're ending 20, you're ending 30. And then the last couple turns of the game, you're ending like 130 points. Um, German railroads or Russian railroads are, is a great example of a game like this where giving one player just one more action could be a huge swing in the points. Now, this one can punish the player who finished first and mm -hmm. could potentially let start player have an advantage over others. Now, second for me would be play one more round. But for some reason, this feels less tactical. I don't know. It just it, it feels boring. Um, it just, hey, we, we, okay, we're done. Now everyone gets one more turn to try to earn points. This tends to happen in race games where the game ends at a certain point and gives everyone a chance to go past that point, right? So yes, the, the goal to end the game is 10, but it's actually the player who mo with the most points wins. Catan's an example, or more recently, one we play a lot more often is Space Base, where yes, the goal's 40. When someone hits 40, the game's going to end and we go around the table one more time, but the final scores might be in the 50s and 60s by the time it all goes around. But like, to me, I don't know. I, I find that uninteresting compared to the other types, but it's still, I, I prefer it than some of the others. But again, that's very personal. So you have to be ready not only to end the game, but put in that little bit more effort to extend past the finish line mm -hmm. and not run out of steam after ending while everyone else yes. surges past. Now, my next one would be finishing out the round. Um, this is lower than the others just because I've been in the position where it stinks being the person who's already gone that round and then someone after you ends the game and you don't get to go again when you're planning on it. You're like, I got my handful of cards. I got two more cards to play. I'm good to go. You go. Okay. You go. Deanna goes, Oh, the game ends. And well, first players, you know, before me, so I don't get to go. And it's just like, oh, I hate that one. That is the one I don't like, especially if you don't see the end game trigger coming. Right. Well, it's easy to say you should be watching the other players. The fact is it's... we all get caught up in our own play from time to time, especially if we're not already proficient mm -hmm. at the game and able to play our own part a little more automatically while focusing on the other player's strategies. Yeah. And then the last one, of course, is at the end of the turn, right? I, if the player finishes out their thing, if they end of the game, the game ends. Uh, this one, I get Catan flashbacks. We played a lot of Catan games um, over one particular summer or a couple years there, and I don't know how many times... I had a plan and I was one move away from making the big move when someone claimed the longest road, then tossed down two victory point cards, somehow got four points in one turn, claimed the win before I got to actually make my move. And here I am ending with like three points at the end of the game when they have 10. Yeah, I have to say that while I'm generally not a big take that player and I'm not super competitive at all, I do perhaps perversely love this <laughs> particular game ending. Fair. It doesn't even benefit me all that much, generally. I'm not the greatest planner, but the feeling of accomplishment when you both end and win in a unified yeah. manner can really kind of bring it all together. I, I guess it's got to be, it's happened to me more often than I pulled it off. It's probably my bias there. <laughs> <laughs> and there is a certain player we all play with that is really good at pulling that off, especially in Catan. Now, the thing is, with all of these, I think they all have their place in the right game. And I've got to say, I don't envy any game designer who's at that point trying to pick which one of these works for their game. Similarly, I don't envy them for coming up with that end game trigger is. Like, how did Jamie decide Scythe ends at six stars and not seven or five? Why does Catan go to 10 and not 11? Or why does 10 scoring cards mean the end of a game in Boba Mahjong? when the other player might only have two. Though I got to say, we're talking about two different things here. And actually, when working on this particular podcast episode, I kept getting distracted by endgame triggers as opposed to endgame mechanisms. I think the topic of endgame triggers is an awesome one and one I think I want to get into, especially Sean did the same thing. He went into the show notes, added a bunch of games, and I'm like, yeah, but those aren't endgames. Those are what trigger the endgame. They're two different things. But you know what? We're not going to dive into that now. That'll be another topic, perhaps a follow-up next week. We'll see. All right. So another part of Donna's question that we haven't tackled yet is if there are any interesting, creative, or unusual end-of-game rules that you've run across. All right. The first one that popped into my head and one I actually really enjoy, though, again, this is one, depending on what end of, the, what end of it you're on, you may love or hate. And that is Clank. 
In Clank, you're rushing into a dungeon, grabbing artifacts and getting out, also defeating monsters, collecting cards. But what happens is the first player that gets out starts triggering an end game. It doesn't quite end there. What happens is a countdown timer starts and players have, I think it's four turns. I didn't double check the rules on Clank before this to also get out. And if they don't, they die. Also, anytime that player's turn comes up, the dragon attacks. So there's an added incentive of players possibly getting knocked out. So the game could end any time. And once it ends, you've got that four more rounds to get out, which may or may not be enough. And then it, of course, speeds up if a second player escapes. Now on both their turns, the dragon attacks. And I think that one's really unique and works fantastic for that game. But I wouldn't want that in Scythe or Space Base. Absolutely. Yeah, Clank is a fantastic one. Uh, and, and it's one of those ones that can hurt uh, hurt or help you. Uh, yes. It's real easy to be the first one out. But if the players still in the dungeon have timed it right, they can hit a couple of big scores and sneak out or at least get up above the ground yep. so that they are pulled out by the... the uh, the citizens and survive to, to count their score. Yeah. Yeah. We always joked about how, if you died above ground, they saw you. So they make a statue of you and you can still win because you live, <laughs> live on in fame. Right. Now, another one that, that I think is unique and it's weird because it combines with this. So, so there's a bunch of games out there that have standard endings me mechanisms. Like we already talked about, right? Whether it's one around the table or end of the turn, that doesn't matter. They have those, but then there's some other condition that can prematurely end the game. These games typically would be normal except for that. So an example of this is the army track in Seven Wonders Duel. If you manage to push it all the way to the opponent's end, you win. Twilight Struggle, a kind of similar one where you have a DEFCON track that moves up and down, but if you ever hit the top level, and I can't remember what's worse, one or five or whatever it is, uh, there's nuclear war. You both lose. You blew up the planet. Sorry. Um, Netrunner. Netrunner normally is the first player to hit seven objective points wins and the game ends, right? Typical above. But then the hacker player has their own end condition where if they take enough net and meat damage, they're out of the game. And similarly, the corporate player has a totally different one that's if their deck ever runs out. So if the corporation runs out of resources, they lose the game. Almost every single Lord of the Rings game has done this differently, but there's some form of capture or destroy the ring video, video condition, sorry victory condition that stacks on top of some other game system. And I think Lord of the Rings is a fascinating one to look at for that because every game does it a little different. Sometimes it's get the ring to Mordor and the Fellowship wins. Other times it's recapture the ring another time. And then what you do is you compare it to War of the Ring is a big war game. Um, what's the um, Lord of the Rings? The confrontation is basically kind of like Stratego. Um, the Lord of the Rings co-op game is you versus the AI, and if Sauron hits you, he captures the ring. And it's neat because you have your own goals, but then there's another thing that's in there that can totally change the way the game ends. Yeah, the Lord of the Rings, it's sort of some of it depends on you know which age of the ring you're in. Where where yes. is the ring that at that particular time <laughs> is going to determine that particular rings and games? Uh, but it's so interesting that these games all have this sort of race condition to the end, but all different or in some cases multiple different race conditions yeah. to that end yeah exactly and then like i said the, the most fascinating thing is like the war of the rings and area control game seven wonders is an engine building game right but they still have that one mechanism that, that the game can end like this if you mess up you got to pay attention and the one we haven't mentioned so far is last man standing this goes back to Saurian Trouble, but also modern games like King of Tokyo or Red Dragon Inn. Now, while player elimination isn't as popular as it used to be, with the right quick enough game, I still enjoy it and I still think it works. And the thing to note here as far as end game is, is the game is going to end at different times for different players. One player is going to get eliminated first and probably have a much shorter game experience than the last player to be eliminated. And... I think this is very cool because the play length shifts like, like some players play for way longer than others. What does that player who was eliminated do? And that's where, where modern games tend to at least give that player something to do if they're eliminated. But like, if you think back to those old games, how many times are you playing with your siblings or your friends and you know, you're eliminated first, you go play something else. 
yeah i mean there was a, there was a whole theme of uh you know either both miss a turn get eliminated uh, all those mechanics that really took away uh player agency uh mm -hmm. essentially and and made get, turned you into a from a player into a spectator Yes. Uh, which is thankfully something that has mostly gone away in the majority of games, although it still exists in certain uh, certain uh, games. Now, another one I thought of that's similar to this, but not the same, is when you can't make any more moves. This seems to be most common in abstract strategy games, multiplayer abstract strategy games. Uh, the game that made me think of this is, hey, that's my fish. Uh, what happens in that game is you can your penguins can be pinned. So you can no longer move. So then your game is done, but everyone else keeps playing. Um, I cannot find the name of it. I don't know if Jerry listens to the show, but if he does, hey, Jerry, give me a shout out. What was the frog based game you taught me at Queen City Conquest with the like ceramic frogs? Because that was a similar one. You were le leaping over leaping or uh, leaping onto lily pads. That's where not leaping pads, lily pads. And you could cut someone off by cutting away their, their way out. And then another example. Um, was, was oh, there's another example i'm drawing a blank again but games where you can cut each other off um the battle sheep that's the other one battle sheep is another one where you're, you're moving your stacks of sheep and you can eventually pin someone in in those your game could end as far as you can't take any more moves and often the last player gets to make a ton of moves where everyone else just has to sit and watch as they clear out the board um Another example is Tiny Towns. That's a modern one where a bingo game where everyone's using the same input. And if you did poorly, if you run out of space on your board, you're done. Now, where this is completely different from player elimination is you're not eliminated. You can still win the game if you run out of moves. And that's happened to me many times in Hey, That's My Fish. Like, yeah, you eliminated me and I can't move anymore, but I got all the three fish. You're just collecting all those ones at the end. It doesn't matter that you're going to get to collect more tiles. I've got the more powerful ones. And yeah. then I was thinking about um, tapestry. I think tapestry also fits in that because you choose when to switch eras. It's one of the most unique things in that game is there are four eras of the game and it's your choice when to switch. Now, generally you do it when you're out of resources, but you can do it at any time. Well, some player has to end the game first and for them, they're done. They're, they're literally just watching. Now, thankfully, the game's engaging enough. I think it's fun to watch the other players finish, especially if you figured out your, your last score and people are creeping up on you. But if you finish and you're in last, there's no fun at the end of Tapestry. I, and I have to say, at least my experience in Tapestry is I've usually finished because everyone else has got a better engine of some sort. And they're just they're already in front of me and I just have run out yes. of things to get score. Um, and, and in one way, that's kind of the, the nice way, nice reason to play it on BGA, because you don't have to see everyone surging <laughs> ahead and crushing your score until the until you see the final totals at the very end. Um, uh, yeah, tapestry, tapestry is one where it definitely fits. Um, and, and thankfully in person, I haven't had that happen, but on, yeah. on BGA, I have had it where it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm done. And, oh, you guys aren't even, co oh, this is going to be an ugly yeah. score. <laughs> Another example of that be Arnak. Mm -hmm. I've definitely seen it in Arnak because any, basically any game where you keep taking actions until you pass, this can happen on that last round. Yeah, absolutely. The uh, Arnak. The, I remember the first time I played Arnak. That's exactly um, what I was thinking. I was, of. You know, I, I had no, I didn't understand it was an engine builder. I kept thinking of it as a deck builder, uh, yeah. and and I just didn't have, I hadn't built an engine to get me the actions to do anything. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, oh well, I, I can't do anything. You guys have like, you guys just keep at it. Have fun. <laughs> Oh. All right. Those are the ones I noted down. Now, again, we weren't looking we're, we're not looking for end game triggers. So when I first looked at this, I had all kinds of other games on here, like Betrayal of House in the Hill, where you never know when it's going to end because you never know what the haunt's going to be. But then I started thinking about it and I'm like, wait, no, the end is always immediate. Whenever you accomplish whatever that goal is on the final haunt, which could be escape the house, uh, find the cat, explore the whole house or kill the werewolf. The actual end game mechanic is the game ends when you accomplish your goal. So I was trying to think of other ones, and I got to say, I'm sure they're out there. That's all that came to mind for me. So what I got out of this is, and I had gone down the wrong direction. I had been researching this. I, I had been thinking triggers uh, and, and, you know, 
and not what comes after the trigger, you know, how many, right. the, the play after. So uh, what I was really thinking about is what is it that makes a good ending? Uh, what what differentiates the, the good from the bad? And we've talked a little bit about what we did like and what we didn't mm-hmm. like. Um, and I think the three things that come up for me that really sort of define the idea for me is tension, immersion, and player agency. Mm-hmm. And those are the, the three things that kind of have a, a massive effect in varying levels, depending on which of those you're looking at. You know, you want to have that tension and the feeling of urgency and, and eagerness, what you don't know if you're going to win and if you're going to lose, what's going to happen. Um, the immersion in the game and, you know, wh- whether or not you feel like you're in it or you've checked out and you're moving on. Yeah. Uh, and then that player agency, you know, what, how much of it is up to you and how much of it the game has determined. Um, yeah. So. No, I totally agree on those. So I, I would argue the tension isn't always good. And that's where this whole thing really depends on the game. If you were playing a light casual game, you don't want that tension at the end. You don't want to be worried about when the game was going to end. You just want to keep playing until it's done and then write up your score and then congratulate the players and move on. Um, Immersion though, definitely right. Like having knowing sides. So going back to our original example of scythe, which again is a little bit more about end game triggers than ending, but it's all about that. It can end in the middle of your turn is what really sticks out to scythe. Well, that adds such a level of tension because you never know. You never know if you're going to get that one more action. And, and, and that's where I love that form of tension now that I know it. Mm-hmm. But when I'm playing with a bunch of um, experts at the game who are just like, ha, 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 blah, you did terrible because you didn't see that coming. I, it stank. It was not fun. Yeah, uh, one of the one of the fun ones I think for tension, and this is going right back down to the complete opposite end of the scale from Scythe, is can't stop right the first the game is over the as soon as somebody gets three rows uh yep. three call th- sorry three columns on the board it's it's over done they win yep. um and who you know it's just number of columns and and if you've if you've been pushing it and you know your your last turn everyone's getting close and you decide to push it and you uh mess up and you get nothing you're di- you're you you go back that you, you just you're praying for someone else to push mm-hmm. it and get that wrong dice and you know roll roll out uh and get stuck so that you have another chance yeah. to make your your thing and and that kind of tension again you know in i mean can't stop is about as light as you get uh, True. but that tension can really work in that mm-hmm. particular game uh whereas you know code names maybe not yeah <laughs> What I was saying, I, I know there there are games out there where players can trigger the end, but I I couldn't find definite examples. One of the most fascinating, but again, I think we're getting more into end game triggers, and that, like I said, that's a delineating line <laughs> that we either needed two hours to talk about both tonight, or we need two episodes. And I'm leaning towards two episodes. Is games with random ending, like a variable randomized ending. Um, the most recent we play is Cowboy Bebop, where you're shuffling in that card, or Pompeii, where you never know when the volcano is going to explode. But again, that's timings. That's not what happens after it explodes. Right, because when you know when that co- when that comes up, there's a, a set number in, in Bebop. There is a set number set, of yep. actions that that have to occur before he yes. leaves or is defeated, and it's done. And but uh, again, you got player agency there because he only moves and if you hit him, right? right? So there's there's a whole thing there. But again, that's triggers, not actual end game mechanics. The end game mechanic in that game is you either defeat the guy and it ends immediately, or he escapes and it ends immediately. Right. Getting getting back to the topic on hand. But again, it'll be interesting control, to see. If, but again, you have control over that ending, yes. which is nice. So the entire table, it's very clear to everyone. Okay. If he's got attacks in his hand, we can defeat him this turn. Or yeah. if you have attacks in your hand, please don't hit him because he's going to leave yeah. this turn if you can't hit him hard enough. Um, so there's that. There's definitely you know, you know player agency in the the number of turns left. You can you can ask someone to not hit him uh, to you know push that game uh, into another round. All right. I I think I, I haven't seen any pop up from the chat we haven't actually mentioned yet. Now, got to say, there aren't a lot, nope. really. Like, there aren't a lot of different ways. What you do once the game ends, that doesn't change. Triggering the game end, I said, whole of the topic. We could go on for hours. But what happens when that trigger hits? 
I, I we seem to have covered them all, and I'm sure we're missing some. Yeah, I, I keep thinking of other games, and then I'm like, nope, that's a trigger. Uh, yep. I'm like, no, what about this one ends, but nope, that's a trigger too. Yeah, um, like even but as like as for the, the actual life, ending of the two game, different end paths. Um, so so I, I got to bring up Arboretum. The only thing you're it, it ends like a normal game unless you tie. Then the game ends in ten years. You plant a tree, then you go see whose tree is the tallest. So you want to see the most unique. Now is that a trigger? That might be a trigger too. Well, no, the game's over. Playing... No, because the game's over. The game has ended. Um, that's a scoring mechanism, really. Yeah, is it though? Um, the game's not over until you. I don't think there's there's a totally different topic. Is the game over until you've determined who's won? I don't think it's over for ten no, no, years. Absolutely, the game is over. The game is over. The scoring phase continues. Nah, to me, a game's not done until you know who won. No, see that that's the, the end the of the game and the scoring phase. Not always are are not always, but can be separate aspects of the experience. Nah, I uh, disagree on that one. You're not. I think the game doesn't end until you until you've calculated the final score and determined who the winner is. See, I don't. I don't find math a game. Um, I D, well, D, D, you D, don't D, like D, Rainier D. Nizia games at all. Then. <laughs> D, D will disagree with me. I, um, but no, I mean, adding up your your totals to me isn't part of the game. That's after the game. Well, well we're about to, to review a game where that's definitely part of the game. Uh, well, yes, that and that's different though. That right? that's how is that different? Well, I, because it is part of the game. So um, when's that game end? Once you picked your six cards, the game's done. In in the case of in the case of Boba Majong. After you have picked your your scoring form, like with the way the way you've chosen to score your your cards. So once you pick six cards, the game's over. No, no. Well, once you've chosen how you are going to score them. Well, that's it. No, you pick the six cards. Then yeah. you score everyone scores the same after that. Right. The, your decision is pick six cards. Anyway, this sounds like a lobby discussion more, but I, I I do not agree with Sean on this one. I know we usually agree a lot on this show. I do not agree. I don't think a game is over. It's just like the in this in in, in with politics. The election's not over. The end of the votes and the tally. It's it's in the end when they're actually sworn in. That's when the election's over, not just at the end of counting the votes. I would say the election's over when no one can vote anymore. Yeah. See, no, I don't <laughs> think so. It's uh, not over till till an official phase moves on, but the election <laughs> ends at whatever time. There we go. Blah blah blah. Cool. Let's All right. Well, at this point, I think <laughs> we've reached the end of the round, and that means it's time to wrap things up. So our lobby here on tur- on Twitch gets one more turn to share their thoughts on end of game mechanisms. Now, before we check in with them, just a reminder: we are here to answer your gaming and game night questions. You can send us questions by clicking on Ask the Bellhop over at tabletopbellhop.com. You can send an email to questions at tabletopbellhop.com, or you can hit me up on socials, which I can be found everywhere as tabletopbellhop, one word. 